Dear colleagues, I am very pleased to introduce you one of the most renowned experts on a very important aspect of future modeling, of another aspect of future modeling, uh, Professor Thomas Ludwig from the German Climate Computing Center in Hamburg, Germany, who will give you a keynote on modeling the future climate. Uh, Thomas Ludwig is a professor for scientific computing at the University of Hamburg. At the same time, he is a director of the German Climate Computing Center, DKRC, in Hamburg. His research focus as a professor is in high performance storage systems and energy efficiency with high performance computing. And as a director of the Climate Computing Center, he takes the responsibility to provide the climate research community with high computational power, considerable storage space and sophisticated services. Thomas Ludwig received his doctoral degree from Technische Universität Munich, Germany in 1992. He received a habilitation degree in 1998 at the same university. And from 2001 to 2009, he held a professor position at the University of Heidelberg. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to his presentation. Uh, Thomas Ludwig, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Welcome everybody uh, to this afternoon's uh, keynote. I will just switch to my slides. Here they are. Well, modeling the future, modeling the future is the title, some concepts and challenges. And also, of course, I will speak about the future of modeling in some sense. So let me start with something, uh, switching, okay. Um, let, let me start with a short overview. At first, I give you some insight about how this climate modeling is done on a computer. And then we will speak about something like cloud computing. Um, I will give you some introduction into the German climate computing center, DKRZ here in Hamburg, and what our duties are and what the infrastructure is that we provide to the researchers. And then we will come to these problems of high performance computing that we see, which is connected to these basic elements to the transistors. And there's something that is called Moore's law. Um, and I will tell you the details about what the problems with this, in fact, it's not a law, it's more an observation with these observations are. And then we will switch to some aspects of machine learning and climate modeling and see how this could bring us into some kind of future of climate modeling. So I will start with um, a person that I find very interesting, Lewis Fry Richardson, who was an early uh, meteorologist, physicist, who published in 1922 a book with the title Weather Prediction by Numerical Process. And he describes there the formula, the, the physical laws that govern how the, the weather develops and what the climate is and so. And there is a nice sentence in his book, which is one of my favorite citations, where Richardson says, perhaps someday in the dim future, it will be possible to advance, weather com to advance computations faster than the weather advances, and that a cost less than the saving to mankind due to the information gained. There are several important aspects in this citation. So first, this dim future. Now, the dim future, obviously, this is us now. Um, he speaks about the speed of this computation faster than the weather advances. Of course, he wants to make a prediction. That's obvious. It is not only interesting to understand how, um, what the governing laws are um, to describe the weather. Also, also, you would like to make a computation that says you in advance what will happen. And also, interestingly, at that time already, he speaks about the costs. And he speaks about costs of doing that and the potential savings. Because savings can be that you say, OK, if I can predict some extreme weather situation, maybe I will trigger some evacuation or something like that. And I will save human lives, for example. So that's an interesting observation that he made at that time already. And then he conceived a concept how to compute that. And he had a plan to use 64,000 computers to really write a parallel program with message passing, load balancing, and so on and so on. There's a complete description in this book. And then you think, uh, just wait, 1922? We hadn't had any computers at that time, right? We hadn't had any computers, but we had humans. And there was at that time, there was this profession of the human computer. 
And Richardson really um, invented a concept that is called Richardson's forecast factory, where he conceived um, a globe-shaped computer room and said, okay, we, we consider this to be our Earth for which we make this weather prediction. Then we divide the area of this Earth into 2,000, 2,000 so-called grid cells. And for each grid cell, we have a number of people who will do the computation. In fact, for each grid cell, we have 32 humans who make this computation. Sitting here, can you, you can see on this, uh, on this image, sitting here on balconies and doing the computation of these differential equations for temperature pressure and these things. And he thought that with 32 people, he can um, make all the mathematical analysis within three hours to predict then the weather for the next three hours. And there was a pole, and this is the description of this book, yeah, there was a pole in the middle of this globe, and then you had some people um, controlling these people on the other people on the balcony, sending them red and blue light signals to control the load balancing between the individual computers. So that was very early 1922. Of course, <laughs> it was not possible to implement that. Uh, it lasted quite some years until we really had then a weather simulation in a computer. And it was only in 1950 that we see this for the first time. And that was the first weather simulation uh, done by Charney, Fjordov, and von Neumann, one of the fathers of computer science, of course. And they made that on ENIAC. Um, remember that the first computer invented by Konrad Zuse was in 41, so it took them a few years then uh, to be ready enough to, to bring these complex partial differential equation solvers um, to a real computer. And that is known under the name NWP, which stands for numerical weather prediction. The first climate simulation was then in 1956. Um, that was at the Princeton Institute where they did that. And it was a very coarse grain uh, climate prediction where they put a layer on the globe of our world with 17 to 16 points. So something like uh, 300 points, less than 300 points altogether. They had a computer with only one kilobyte of main memory and two kilobyte of mag magnetic memory. And they computed something that this term is still used uh, global circulation model, these are just the models um, for with which you compute what's going on on the world, yeah? instead of, let's say, local models where you have individual countries or something like that, that you simulate. Let me just, because maybe this is not known to everybody, I, I didn't know it before I came to DKRZ, uh, let me just explain you shortly the difference between weather and climate. So when we look outside of our window, then the thing that we see, the state of the atmosphere, that is what is called weather. So it's called co hot or cold, wet or dry. Uh, in, well, in Hamburg, if I look out of my window, it's, <laughs> it's usually wet and it's cool. Uh, yeah, my, my wife always asks me when finally climate change will come to Hamburg. It's, it, is, it did almost arrive. Yeah, this summer was not that bad. Climate in contrast is the statistics of the weather. And that is important to know because climate is a mathematical construct. Yeah, you, you cannot observe that. And that, that's also the reason why it's not so easy to predict it. It's statistical um, analysis of what goes on usually over a longer period of time. And usually they make an averaging over 30 years. So when we look at how climate is then simulated what the individual components are that a climate simulation system is composed of then first and most important you have the energy that comes from the sun you have this energy coming to the earth going into the oceans going to the to the land and then you have reflection of this energy going back to outer space you do have some clouds that prevent the sun to heat the earth and that prevent the earth to, to disseminate um, the heat, for example. From the clouds, you have some precipitation, but that is very complicated to compute. You have some sea ice. The sea ice, um, the computation of the sea ice is not so easy. Um, in the past, when the computers were not so powerful, at least what the people did was to say, okay, if you have sea ice, then the surface is white and if you have a white survey surface with this so-called albedo then um, the reflection of the energy is much higher and the warming of the earth is um, 
is less. All these components then put together will make already a very complicated climate model. And in addition, you will have things like vulcanese, for example, volcanic gases and particles. You might have snow and ice on the mountains, very difficult to compute. And also we have uh, human activities. And I, I used to add to this nice figure that comes from one of our colleagues. I used to add this picture of the German Climate Computing Center as a representative of compute centers and as a representative of, of ICT, Information and Communication Technology, because the influence in energy consumption of ICT is already in the range of, well, nobody knows exactly, but it should be in the range of 5 to 10 percent with a strongly rising tendency. That means energy consumption of these components is high, and we have to keep that in mind. I will come back to that point later. So when we look at how the modeling is done, then usually um, they have these partial differential equations that describe, let's say, uh, wind temperature, uh, humidity, and things like that. And you need to discretize that because uh, you are only able to solve these equations in an iterative discretized manner. So we do a discretization of the space. We make so-called grid cells here. On our globe, if it's a global model, we make it in three directions, X, Y, and Z direction. And then we have also a discretization of time. And then we compute every time step what, uh, how the parameters change in these individual grid cells. So the important point is when you do a bisection of the grid distance, that means uh, the usual models, for example, that we have today, they have something like a grid distance of 100 kilometers. You want to go down to 50 kilometers. So you do this bisection, but you have to do it in X, Y, and Z direction. That means uh, two times two times two, you need a factor of eight with respect to computational power to be able to compute that. And then you have to make the time step shorter. You have to divide it by two. That means in order to make a bisection of the grid, of the grid distance here, um, you have to have a computer that is 16 times more powerful to solve the same model in a reasonable, in the same time in the end. But then you have a higher resolution, of course, and you will see more things. If we look at the historic development of the climate models, then it started very early with the global atmospheric models, let's say in the 70s, um, then with grid distances of 200, 500 kilometers, something like that. And um, shortly after that, we see that as independent components, the colleagues developed some models for ocean ocean temperature, ocean currents, and sea ice. And then also there was the land surface model by which you can model whether you have fields or forests or cities and how the influence on the climate development will be. Then over the years, we see that we get more and more submodels, and the submodels um, by the time always get integrated into these uh, overall general models so that nowadays you what the people what the colleagues do is that they simulate the atmosphere then the land surface the ocean sulfate then a complete carbon cycle a dynamic vegetation and also chemistry not all the models um, evaluate all the variables at the same time, because then if you, if you do so, then you are in the range for having maybe 200 variables for each grid point, uh, which is extremely compute intensive for a global model. Instead, sometimes they are more interested in chemistry, sometimes they are more interested in biology, for example, and then uh, have these components being activated and the other ones switch off. So, Seen from the point of view of software engineering, we see that we have something like um, programs in the range of several hundreds of thousands of lines going up to several millions of lines of code, uh, plus development times of more than 10 years, usually with bigger teams. So that is a long lasting effort to push these models forward. So what do they do today? Today, the most important is cloud computing in the end. So they, they try to compute clouds on, an, on a global uh, scale. And I will start this small film that shows you the cloud simulation with a five kilometer grid per cell, uh, 21 million cells here. 
um, we tested it so it does the running of my of the video is only smooth on my computer here but with this uh, video conference it will oops that was the wrong button it will not be that smoothly on your screen but nevertheless it should give you an impression uh what what the people do here so if you could see the film directly, then you would see that there's a cloud movement that really looks like as you see it on a satellite film you know, when, when the time is shortened then. So this is a simulation that simulates uh, 21 days. And I will continue and show you a little bit the technical details of that. Um, tja should no okay sorry <laughs> so i always call this cloud comp computing but in fact of course it's cloud and precipitation simulation they try now to do this on a global model with a global model for the whole whole earth then we have uh, 21 million cells per level we have 136 levels in set direction which means we have almost 3 billion cells in the simulation so 2.8 million and remember that for this first climate simulation we had something in the range of 280 cells 280 and now we have 10 million times more cells to compute so we do this with a with a part of our parallel computer we use 1000 compute nodes of our computer to produce um, 40 simulated days on one real day so so the ratio is 40 to 1 you have to keep in mind that usually with these models because it's a climate model also this is a mixture between climate and weather already but it should be used in the climate model what the people want to do is um, to to run this for a sim for 100 simulated years but as the range is 40 to 1 then making a 100 year simulation would take would would uh, ask for 2.5 years for the simulation on a parallel computer and that is of course too long so what they did is just as a proof of um, concept is that they made this 22 day simulation but even with the simulation it's difficult with the output of the data because for each time step we make a time step every half an hour of simulated time we have 110 gigabyte of data that we write to disk and for uh, this uh, film here we have uh, five tera no excuse me we have uh, five terabyte per simulated day times 22 days that we simulated so it's something in the range of 100 terabyte that goes to disk which afterwards you need to visualize so that's not an easy task and then the question is, okay, where can you do that? And this is just the German Climate Computing Center that provides the infrastructure for being able to make that kind of simulation. It was founded in 1887. It has four shareholders. It grew out of a joint compute center between the University of Hamburg and the Max Planck Institute for Meteorology. And then they decided to make this an independent legal unit. And this is why we are operated as a, as a nonprofit limited company. We have something like 90 people here and my research group is also integrated and the focus of the research is everything that deals with uh, storage systems. Let me give you a short overview of the machines that we had in the past. So in 85, the DKR set started with a one processor machine and then they had a, which was a, a control data cyber CDC 205. Then we had a Cray with four processors, a Cray with 16 an NEC machine with 192 processors. Then when I came to Dikara in 2009, they already had 8,500 processors and now they have, we have more than 100,000. And we buy a machine that will be installed in the next year. One thing that I would like to tell you is that the machine that we had in 85 was approximately as powerful as an old iPhone. So this is the picture of an iPhone one. Uh, maybe the iPhone one was a little bit better than that one, but basically it's just like a old fashioned uh, smartphone, the power of this machine. So you have to keep in mind that in 85, the whole German climate research community conducted its research on a device that nowadays goes into your pocket and is battery driven. And at that time it was room filling with 110 kilowatt electrical power. 
This is a picture of the machine as we have it today. So you can see um, we have something like 80 racks here in the building. Um, it is so-called hot liquid cooling, which is highly efficient, um, but it takes a lot of electrical energy. So we use something like 1.4 megawatt with this environment that costs us 2 million euro per year just for electricity only. The unit for the calculation is uh, defined as flops floating point operations and this machine has 3.6 petaflops uh, 3.6 times 10 to the power of 15 which is um, the quadrillion so the german word is billiarde it's always a little bit difficult to translate that that's why i say it if we look at the development over time of our machines, then um, it is very nice to see that there was kind of a recording of these values over the time. And that started in 93 with the so-called top 500 list. The top 500 list um, takes as a ranking the 500 most powerful systems in the world, and they publish that two times per year. And that is nice to have because we always have some historical data what the development of high performance computing over time was. And we see here the blue line, which is um, the machine on rank 500 of this list. This is a very smooth line. Then we see the red line that is the machine on rank number one of the list. The y axis of this uh, chart is logarithmic that means um, each um, unit here means a factor of 10 in improvement of computational power and what we see over time for dicker set is that whenever we bought a new machine we came in into the ranks of the list um, uh, in, in, on a quite well rank let's say um, below 100 uh, and um, but then stayed at that rank for, I mean, stayed at that position, fell out of the list at some time, and then came back with a new machine. And interesting to note is that when we look at the time difference between when, a, when we had a certain computational performance and the time when this computational performance was on rank number one of the top 500 list, then usually this is something in the range of four years, five years. That means we are behind the top one machine always with a time lag of something like five years. The question is, of course, how will this continue? And the continuation is, uh, this is the same chart, but we have in the green line, we have the aggregated number of all 500 machines. And I will give you some additional information in that. In the past, for many, for several decades, even if we look back in history, we found that we had an increase of computational power with a factor of something like 1,000 in 12 years. But then there was a deflection point in, let's say, 2010, a little bit earlier already, and it goes down to maybe a factor of 1,000 only in 20 years. So we don't see that much progress in the computational environment. And if we look at the small section over here and then we look at, at the next important step with high performance computing which is just this exascale computing then we see that our approaching of the number one machine to exascale is very very slow everyone when we touched when we crossed the petaflops line in 2008 then people thought okay 12 years later we will be there we will have an exaflops computer with exaflops we can do cloud computing for example but this will not happen in the next three, four years or so. It slowed down considerably. And the reason is just what goes on in um, silicon technology. So there was this observation by Moore. Uh, Moore was um, a very, was CEO of Intel and co-founder of Fairchild Semiconductor. So stayed within this transistor technology business for many, many years. And there was this observation in the early years that the density of transistors in the chips increased dramatically over time. So Moore said as an observation that the number of transistors doubles every two years. And usually with this, you also double the computational performance and you decrease the energy consumption of these devices. So that means the transistors at the time got smaller and smaller. Currently we are in the range of a few nanometers only. Um, that is, of course, a technical problem. Then they use less energy. We can operate them at higher frequency, and you can put more of these transistors onto the chip. 
and the transistors because they do this binary switching between on and off. They are just the components that you need for having the binary arithmetic and all that being integrated um, that in the chip, in the processor that runs our computer. So we could follow this path of transistor development from its uh, invention in, 19, in 47, 1947 up to, to, to about 2005. But then we started to hit some physical borders, some physical limits, and it got extremely complicated to make the transistors smaller. And so it stalled and it almost stopped. Yeah? So we could not easily or people cannot easily make them smaller and more powerful. Of course, they will always get a little bit less expensive because you sell more of them. But for us as the provider of computational power in the compute center, the consequence is that we cannot easily buy more powerful computers. Of course, we can buy more computers, but if we buy more computers, we need more space and we also have a higher power consumption. I will show you the numbers in a minute. This is also here a chart that shows us the limits of the semiconductor technology because it shows us the costs of, of these uh, factories that they need to construct the chips. And uh, here on the y-axis, in fact, this is billions of euros. So that means when they want to produce a new family, a new generation of processors and need a factory for that, then the factory will cost them in the range of 10 to 20 million euros, billion euros, excuse me, billion euros. And that means, of course, that from the economic point of view, that that is a critical thing. You will not see many of these factories. Now, and it also physically, it gets more and more complicated. If we look at the consequences of this complication that Dikara said, um, and I look back in history to the machines that we have, we can easily see that this slowdown of acceleration. Uh, we more or less always have the same amount of money. So when I came to the company, then we installed this, they already had installed this IBM machine that was in the range of 35 million euro investment. And then we had the bull in 2015 with 41 million. And now we will next year, we will install the next generation with something like 45 million investment, 45 million euro investment. And we had an increase of computational performance from NEC to IBM of a factor of 100, then from IBM to Bull of a factor of 22, and now it's only a factor of five. Yeah? And with a factor of five, you cannot even do this bisection of the grid because when you want to bisect the grid distance, then you need at least a factor of 16. At the time when we wrote the proposal to the funding agencies in 2016, we hoped that we will be able to see a factor of 10 on uh, improvement of computational performance. And we collected some use cases of our climate scientists and the use cases said, okay, what the climatists, climate scientists want to see is an improvement in the machine of a factor between 10 and 1000. So the, the most demanding use case was a factor of 1000. Now we get a factor of five, which means qualitatively, none of the collected, I think it was 12 use cases, can be satisfied because of the slowdown of the development in the transistor technology. And that is, of course, a problematic thing for all the researchers who use high performance computing. And also the power consumption goes up at DCAR set, it will double. So that means the expenses will go up from 2 million euro for electricity per year to 4 million euro. And that is a high burden for our shareholders. We are uh, in the same range as the other centers uh, with who we are partners more or less. And we see these numbers also at Munich and at Stuttgart. And let me tell you, the important point here for society is we see this in high, com high performance computing, but of course this is true for every technology, every IT based technology. That means of course you had this progress from the iPhone one to the iPhone 12, but even between iPhone 11 and iPhone 12, there's not much difference. The, the point is nowadays there's no progress in transistor technology with a new device, let it be a smartphone or it can be a microscope for the biologist or whatever, or your digital camera. Um, the next generation will hardly have more transistors in the processors. As a consequence, it will hardly have more features. So you will not easily buy it 
Yeah, because there's no reason to buy it. So when these generations are getting longer and for smartphones, we do see that already. People don't replace the smartphone so quickly. That means also for the people who do the software development, you don't need so many of them. Because if you cannot, if you cannot quickly sell more powerful hardware, uh, you can also not easily integrate more software features. No? So it has a um, influence on the economy, on the overall IT-based economy that is already visible. And there had already been talks on that. And that is quite, quite interesting to see. So I think the next step will be um, that we move in some way forward because this traditional high-performance computing is, comes a little bit to the end. Traditional means we have differential equations, we have conventional processors and we have a valid Moore's law, which means I just lean back and one year later I can buy a more powerful computer. Uh, this is no longer the case. So there are no more low hanging fruits with these computers in particular and, and maybe there are no fruits at all and I have to change my strategy. One uh, aspect at the horizon, not today, but in let's say 10 years, maybe 15 years, uh, will be the quantum computer. Google already uh, said already, of course, that they can do computations on a quantum computer. Um, but the example algorithm that they showed us was a kind of a mathematical problem of random number generation that has no real connection to what we need in reality. But of course, they are on the track with the quantum computer and we will see this as a device in the future. But um, there's a gap between today and the time of point where this will be available. And this gap has to be filled. And I think uh, I'm convinced that we just have to invest more brainware because we do have our current computers, um, but they are not efficiently used. So we need a better modeling of the codes. We need, in fact, much better software engineering. This is true in particular for our climate uh, scientists because they do all these things on their own. There is not much of cooperation between software engineering specialists on the computer science side and what they do in climate science. So we need more interdisciplinary teams than to exploit the power of the existing machines much better. And then of course, we can adapt, adopt uh, new methods like data intensive science. I will not speak about that and also machine learning. And I will give you some short insight on that. There was a nice paper on machine learning. Uh, in fact, uh, this is really uh, strange, but they always call it artificial intelligence. But whenever they write artificial intelligence, in fact, they speak about machine learning. So when you read AI here, then just keep in mind, usually they think it's, it's ML. Okay, but ML is nice. They do this deep learning. And um, there was a paper that said that progress with machine learning has much is faster than with Moore's law and that we come to this age of the algorithm. That's an interesting observation. It's a nice paper to read that. And uh, I give you only one example of that paper where they speak about this so-called large scale visual recognition challenge. And they uh, show us the values of improvement on the error rate with this image classification with certain algorithms that they have being based on machine learning concepts. And this one here, um, this AlexNet, for example, is based on deep convolutional networks. And that means that even on nowadays machines with these improved algorithms, even if the increase in speed with the machine is not as high, but you will have a high increase of efficiency of the algorithms. And that is, of course, good to have. In 2018, on our supercomputing conference, which is the most important for the high performance field, high performance computing field, there's always this Gordon Bell Prize and they awarded the Gordon Bell Prize to something um, where they said exascale deep learning for climate analytics. And then if you read through the text, then usually, and I will just in a minute tell you the difference about that, then it shows that, yeah, it is a nice work that they do, but it's not about climate analytics. In fact, it's about weather patterns. It's about detection of extreme weather situations with a neural network on a powerful machine. That's extremely nice to have, but it's only a certain aspect of um, what you need then in the field of climate, because in, in fact, it's not really climate, you know, it's, it's weather. And when you speak about weather and weather patterns, 
then the positive thing that you have is always that you com can compare pictures from satellite with predictions from uh, models. And this is true for weather, but this is not true for climate, of course. A colleague of mine who just entered my group recently, Christopher Cardo, he published a nice paper about how to use um, machine learning for climate purposes. And it goes, it, it deals with filling gaps in incomplete data. So there are uh, neural networks that do the following. You train them with pictures, in particular here with pictures of buildings, for example, and then the pictures have scratches. And then from all these trained data, they can reconstruct some kind of a picture. That is obviously not the original one, but maybe resembles the original one. You could do, can do the same with faces. And starting from that observation, he, he used a neural network and trained it to reconstruct climate scenarios where the values are missing. And in particular, um, when you have historical climate data where you have missing observational values, then you can use this uh, method. And they checked it with some ref with some uh, with some data outside of the training data set, and then could do reconstruction of scenarios where the reconstructed climate situation was very close to the original one. That is already published in Nature Geoscience, and uh, we try to continue that in that field. But let me make a final remark on this weather and climate thing. So weather, as we said, is the state of the atmosphere, and climate is the statistics of that. So. My observation is that it's very easy um, to apply machine learning to weather prediction because with weather prediction, you would like to have it done quickly. It is more or less wrong anyway. And, but if you use machine learning, then for example, you will, can, can, you can, you, you will be able to come to a faster prediction of something that is approximately correct. But with climate projection, this will, of course, not work because the researchers are interested in the truth, more or less. So when you, if you apply machine learning concepts, yeah, you might be faster getting to some result, but the result will be blurred. It will not be exact. So you don't know exactly what to think about it. So I think with climate projection, that's, uh, that's a complicated thing, um, how to use it. So let me summarize. Um, there's a lot of progress in machine learning over decades already. And we have this situation that for high performance computing due to the hardware issues, we have a slowdown. So definitely we can apply this machine learning aspects um, to high performance computing and come to some, some new algorithmic ideas how to do that. And we use that at Decara set already and with our customers and will extend that. And Fortunately, yesterday we had this nice talk of Christiane Floyd and she said on her last slide, machine learning will not help us to develop images of possible future worlds. And that is what I, what I truly believe. Yeah? So it's really, it is a hard challenge to say anything about the future in particular with these future climate simulations. Thank you very much for your attention.